Good morning! In today's video, I'm going to make a medieval, well, more like early renaissance men's tunic. And to give a little bit of extra context, uh, we actually have a camping trip tomorrow for one of our medieval dress-up events. And normally I'd be busy packing and trying to make sure I'm remembering everything, but we actually went ahead and packed last night. So. I kind of have a free day with nothing to do, which means that I'm going to do something a little bit inadvisable, which is try to get a garment done in the next 24 hours. We're leaving tomorrow morning. It's not quite 10 a.m. today, so I have all of today and this evening and maybe a little bit tomorrow morning. So in actuality, I have more like 12 hours to see if I can get this tunic done. But I thought that a speed run would be kind of a fun project. So I guess here we go. Let's see if I can get it done. So before Mr. Donner went off to work today, I made sure to grab his measurements so that I could draft out a quick and dirty tunic pattern for him. In theory, this shouldn't be a very complicated pattern, and as long as it fits him kind of okay in the shoulders and chest, everything below that will be loose, so we have a lot of wiggle room. Just to give you, and honestly myself, a quick visual of what I'm making today, it's going to be a wide tunic, full at the hem with slightly fitted arms. To draft it out, I'm starting with the center front and adding some initial measurements, like the length, chest circumference, and shoulder width. A thought struck me, as I remembered that I do have a couple old doublet patterns for him in my pattern box, so I dug out this one. The shoulder seam does not match up here at very well at all, so I've decided to use the doublet version instead, fearing that maybe I mismeasured earlier this morning. Now, in general, I would strongly, strongly recommend always doing a mock-up with something like this, since there is an awful lot of guesswork going into this. But that's not an option today, so I plowed ahead, hoping that everything will turn out fine. Needing a little bit of reassurance, though, I dug through my various pattern books, flipping until I found patterns that looked very similar to what I had drafted out. And I do indeed feel a bit reassured that I'm on the right track, so I'll go ahead and start adding the seam allowance to the pattern. I use 1 inch seam allowance on the front for the button overlap and 5 eighths of an inch around the rest of the pattern. I dug out this sleeve pattern to use as a guideline for making the tunic sleeve pattern, although I don't actually know what garment this pattern was originally for. I really hate it when I forget to label a pattern piece. Although the fact that it is much shorter than what I measured his arm length to be this morning tells me that mm, this is probably a sleeve that was originally meant for me. That aside, I'll go ahead and make marks to match his wrist measurement, or really his hand circumference, since the sleeve will not be buttoned at the cuff and therefore needs to be big enough for his hand to fit through. Next up, I'll double check his bicep and forearm measurements and add the curvy arm side to the top of the pattern. I will stick with the same 5 8 seam allowance that I used for the rest of the tunic just to keep things mostly consistent. My piece of paper isn't quite large enough here, but my measurements were generous, so I'm just continue fudging things along. And this time I will label the pattern, because labels are important when it comes to sewing. I would like my pattern to be just a little bit more symmetrical than it currently is, so I'll fold it in half, mark off the excess, and then cut that excess off. If you've only ever done a sleeve where the seam goes under the arm, this might look kind of weird to you, but don't worry, that curvy sleeve head will match up just fine and it'll become a sleeve with the seam at the back of the arm instead of underneath. Now that I have a rudimentary pattern, I need to pick out the fabric for the tunic. I have a bunch of wool in one to three yard or so. So let's take a look and see what might fit our paper pattern pieces. This yellow tan fabric is really nicely reminiscent of many of the tunics from my original inspiration images, but it ended up being about half a yard too short. I actually tried several more pieces of fabric in my stash, but the video cut out, so let's jump to the final choice that I ended up with, this very light gray-blue wool with a really pretty diagonal twill weave. The uh, client, so to speak, wants a very light garment for day-to-day -day use, so I will not be lining this tunic. This light gray-blue wool will be the only fabric. 
I'll pin the paper pattern to the fabric and then start cutting out my pieces. You'll note here that I have made sure to put the back piece on the fold because that way I can have the back as one continuous piece with no seam down the middle. Although, mm, <laughs> here's where I've just realized that I have the one inch seam allowance currently included in the fold, which is no good. It'll make it two inches wider than I originally drafted for. But Fortunately, I caught it in time, so let's go ahead and unpin the pattern, fold the seam allowance under and out of the way, and then repin the pattern to the fabric. Whenever I cut out the back pattern, I need to make sure that I use the higher neckline, since the lower neckline will be for the front tuning pieces. The back is done, so I'll unfold the front seam allowance and pin the pattern paper back onto the fabric, but this time, the center will be on the selvage, or edge of the fabric, not on a fold. To transfer this lower inner neckline, I will place the pattern on the fabric and then fold the paper down using my nail to crisply fold where the neckline is. Same deal with the sleeves. Pin, cut, done. Once the sleeves are cut out, however, I like to immediately fold them in half, making sure that I have a pair of mirrored sleeves, since this will make sure that I don't accidentally make two less sleeves. Not that that's ever happened. Pinning the tunic is fairly straightforward. I put the back piece down on the table first, and then the two front pieces on top, using pins to temporarily line up the shoulder and side seams. I'll sew those pin sleeves really quick, removing pins as I go, and the sleeves are also ready to be attached, but this is a step where I always have to slow down and take a moment to truly check and double check and triple check that I'm correctly putting the sleeves on their respective arms, since I personally find it very easy to accidentally sew a sleeve on inside out or backwards or switching the arms. <laughs> Once I am very sure that I have the orientation correct, I will pin the sleeve onto the arm side, starting with the top and the bottom. This sleeve will need to be slightly gathered into the armhole, so I'm using lots of pins to make that gathering as sort of spread out as possible. The same step for the other arm, and then we can sew on the sleeve. I'm going to flat fell the side seams of the tunic later, so as I'm sewing the arm now, I'm carefully avoiding that little bit of seam allowance. I want it to stay free. Checking over the new seam, I see that little pleat here that I don't like, so I'm going to seam rip that thread out and then re-sew it to remove the pleat. My main pattern pieces are all sewn together now, and it's time to start treating the various raw edges of the fabric. For the neckline, I'll sew in a facing, since a curved seam like this is a little bit tough to hem. For the bottom hem, I will probably just do a double fold, and for the front opening, I could get away with doing nothing since the selvage on this is actually really nice for the fabric, but I think I will fold it back once so that the buttons and buttonholes have a thicker area to support their extra stitching. The cuffs will get a very narrow double fold, and the arm side inside the tunic will probably be bound in bias tape. As I was looking over the various seams that I'll need to secure, I realized that the shoulder comes out slightly to a point, when it should be a nice straight smooth line here. It is, I admit, a little tempting to just leave it be, but it'll sit a lot nicer when worn if I just go ahead and fix it now. Little mishaps like this are just sort of the nature of self-drafted patterns by hobbyists like me. Never mind that, let's go ahead and work on the neck facing. In order to reduce bulk in the shoulder, instead of repeating the little seams where the front and back pieces meet, I'll cut the facing out as one solid piece of fabric. Pin things down as flat as possible, and then cut away the unneeded fabric inside the facing. Sew the facing to the tunic, again skipping past the seams, since I'll want to do those by hand later. The facing is currently on the outside of the fabric, so now I'm going to flip it in towards the inside and then pin it down, ever so slightly rolling the fabric so that the seam is just a little bit more on the inside than the out. This will make it just a little bit less visible on the finished garment. The shoulder seams will need to be tended to before I can sew the facing down, so I opened the seam allowance and folded the raw edges under. I'm using a whip stitch to secure them down. While I was at it, I also hand tacked the facing edge here. This top stitching will help keep everything nice and neat even after the coat is washed. The facing is still a little bit rough and long, so I'll mark out an even width and then cut off the excess. Just like the shoulder seam, the raw edges will be folded under and then whip stitched down. 
I'll leave the corner alone for now though, since I haven't exactly decided how deep I want to make the button fold here. For the side seams, I've decided that I'm going to flat fell the allowance, so I'm trimming away one half of the allowance down on one piece, and then folding the longer edge around it, and I'll secure that down with more whip stitches. For the bottom hem, I've decided to indulge my lazy speed conscious side, and we'll go ahead and let the sewing machine take care of this. I want to do a blind hem, so first I will do a small fold, securing it in place with pins, then a deeper fold around an inch or so. The second fold must be pinned with the pins out of the way, because whenever you put it on the sewing machine, you want plenty of room away from the presser foot. This is called a blind hem, although if you've lost your sewing machine manual, here's what it looks like on the machine. Watch how I fold the pin sleeve down. You want the little fold to be the main recipient of the stitches. The machine will do several stitches into the right side, and occasionally it'll jump over and take a single stitch on the left. Whenever you take it off the machine, you'll see that most of the stitching is inside of the hem, and you can kind of just barely maybe make out a few stitches on the outside. This fabric is especially forgiving. I can barely see the stitches on the front at all. Mr. Donner has come home, so now I can give him the tunic to try on, and the main glaring issue is the shoulder ended up way too low. If I hadn't made that adjustment with the old doublet pattern, I would have been fine. Uh, fortunately, this is a pretty quick fix, at least if you don't mind being a little slapdash. I mark the new cut line, attempting to be fairly even on the two different shoulders, and then the seam rip, the shoulder seam open. I cut off an inch or so of that excess, pinned the sleeve head back into place, and then re-sewed the sleeve back on. It's not perfect, but it is much better now. The top half of the tunic will get a button closure, but the bottom half will just be sewn closed permanently. I probably should have done this before the hem, but oh well, it's easy enough to go ahead and seam rip that open, just enough that I can sew the front seam in place. At this point, I took a bit of a break for dinner and social time, although perhaps the break was a smidge longer than strictly necessary. Before I knew it, it was getting pretty late, and I still really wanted to get the buttons done before I went to bed. I decided to go with fabric buttons for this project, and after making a few testers off camera, I decided that the two and a half inch buttons looked just about right. I'm only making four buttons, so I didn't bother making a paper pattern to keep for later. I just cut a circle of fabric until it looked about right in diameter, and then I made three more. To make a fabric button, you gather the edge of the circle of fabric with a loose running stitch, and then once you've made the whole circle round, start pulling it tight, squishing it down into a flattish disc as you pull. I'll go ahead and do a few more rounds of stitches once it's gathered, and that allows me to pull everything sort of extra tight. Then I pretty much repeat that exact same step, gathering the new edge of the disc with running stitches. Again, be extra, extra careful not to make the stitches too small, or you won't be able to pull the gathers in because you're trying to put too much material into too small of a space. I make a couple passes around, focusing more and more on the outer loop edges as I go, until I end up with a fairly nice and firm little ball like this. Once I'm satisfied, I'll cut the thread off of the needle near the eye, since I want to use what's left over of this thread to stitch the button onto the tunic. It's already after 10 p.m., guys, so I'm going to finish up those last three buttons and then head to bed. It's next morning, and we'll be heading out soon, but I have just a little bit of downtime, so I'll baste the front edge using really big running stitches to save time. I'll have to go back later and properly sew it with smaller stitches, but this will work for now though, and it allows me to sew the buttons on. To attach a fabric button, choose your placement, and then make several stitches going back and forth between the tunic and the underside of your button. Try to change out where exactly you're running stitches through the two parts. That'll help spread out the stress point. Leave a little bit of room between the button and the tunic as you work, because you're going to need a little slack there when you wrap the thread around to make a shank. I like to wrap the thread around maybe three or four times, and then exit my thread through a section of the button on the bottom, tying a knot on the underside in a fold if possible, and then run the needle through the button itself, cutting off the excess at the top. Now the tail of your thread is hidden inside the button. <laughs> 
we are in the car and on our way to the camping site. I have a couple more hours until we arrive, so I'll sew the facing edge down and see if I can maybe get some buttonholes done. Well, I managed to get three out of four buttonholes sewn, which fortunately is enough that he could at least wear it at the event, although I wish I had been able to give it a good bit of ironing first. Oh well, at least it got some use. We are back home, and I might as well go ahead and finish that last buttonhole now. My button stitch isn't beautiful, but it's still functional. To start off my buttonhole, I like to do a running back stitch in a rectangle to stabilize the area that will be cut. Then I use a seam ripper to cut the opening, and I recommend trying the button through that opening to make sure it fits before continuing. Then I'll do a stitch around the new cut edge, not pulling tight, just enough to keep the long threads from unraveling. This isn't really a super fray prone fabric, but I find it helps anyway. Once you've completed one round, you'll want to go over that whole area again, but with a buttonhole stitch. I particularly like to use what I've heard referred to as a tailoring buttonhole stitch, which I'll try to show here. You want to replicate this arrangement right here with a thread on top, making a little loop or circle, and then you'll make the stitch through the fabric, coming in through the opening and then up and out through the fabric. That will make this nice, neat little knot on the edge, which will help protect the cut fabric from repeated abrasion of the button whenever you button and unbutton your tunic each time. Oops. I'll let you watch that a couple more times, but I personally have found it most helpful when I learn the stitch to have a diagram type image pulled up on the computer or on my phone, clearly showing where the thread and needle went. Yay, new buttonhole! To finish the insides of the sleeves, I cut away one half of the seam allowance on one side and then folded the longer allowance around the smaller, just like the side seam. I'll whip stitch that closed and then for the cuff, I'll fold the fabric in twice, making a narrow hem and also whip stitch that closed. I might have mentioned it before, but whip stitch is easily my favorite. It's quick, neat, elastic, and suits many different situations. And with that, I'm all done. I didn't quite 100% finish the tunic in time for the event, but it was wearable anyways. Looking at my video timestamps, it looks like it took me about 12 hours to make, which actually means I could have possibly made the deadline if I'd used a little bit more machine stitching, especially with the buttonholes, or if I'd used maybe pre-made brass buttons instead of cloth ones, but on the whole, not bad. I hope that you've been enjoying the project so far. We just have one piece left to make this old man carpenter outfit complete. Stay tuned if you want to check it out. <laughs>